Um, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 37. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a, a passage, I think we've got a slide of it, uh, of 2 Chronicles 31, because this, this is history. I don't know, does anybody love history? Just love studying history? There, yeah, yeah. I hated it. I literally just hated it. Why would anybody study history until I became a Christian? And then I started to see the value. And that's what we're talking about today is, is a lot of history. In 2 Chronicles 31, it says this about Hezekiah. It says, Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good, right, and true before the Lord his God. Every work which he began in the service of the house of God, in law and in commandment, seeking his God, he did with all his heart and prospered. And John brought this up last week. Hezekiah turned the whole nation back to God. He got the, he got the temple open again. They, they gathered everybody and, and celebrated the Passover, which hadn't been done for a long time. His dad was turning away from God, but Hezekiah now has turned the whole nation back to God. He got rid of the places of worship for false gods, you know, those what so-called high places. He restored the authenticity of the priests, he, re, he brought back the utensils, remade the utensils that his father had sold and used for other purposes, and he commanded the faithful handling of tithes and offerings. Okay, so Hezekiah was turning them back, and the, the country was prospering. The next verse says this. This is 2 Chronicles 32.1. After these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and besieged the fortified cities and thought to break them into them for himself. Don't miss the significance of what just happened here. Hezekiah is doing everything right in the eyes of God. Everything is going good. Everything is prospering. And then they get attacked. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, John also brought up that history is both sides. And I was trying to figure out, you know, a title for this, and there's, there's a bunch of them. Uh, one of them could be the tale of two kings. Because really what they're doing is they're saying these two kings have history written about them and from them. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 37, which is Hezekiah's story. But Sennacherib also has a story. And there's some, uh, these uh, prisms. Here's a picture of some prisms. These are uh, clay, yeah, prisms, I don't know what else to say, okay, uh, that Sennacherib made during his time. So these are authentic from his time, and they're history written on the sides of these things, telling about all of his conquests. The, the one on the left is in London, the one in the middle is in Chicago, and the one on the right is in Jerusalem. Okay, and you can, somebody can read them, I can't read them, but, and they've been translated. Here's a, just a snippet out of, I think it's the top of panel two into, or the bottom of panel two to the top of panel three. It's kind of interesting. It was very interesting reading, by the way. Okay, it was crazy reading. This is what Sennacherib said about his conquest of Judah, of Hezekiah. As, as for the king of Judah, Hezekiah, who had not submitted to my authority, I besieged and captured 46 of his fortified cities, along with many smaller towns taken in battle with my battering rams. And he goes on, he says, I took as plunder 200,150 people, both small and great, male and female, along with a great number of animals, including horses, mules, donkeys, camels, oxen, and sheep. As for Hezekiah, I shut him up like a caged bird in his royal city of Jerusalem. I then constructed a series of fortresses around him, and I did not allow anyone to come out of the city gates. His towns, which I captured, I gave to the kings of Ashdod, and so on. Okay, so that's Sennacherib's view of this. We're going to go in, and we're going to look at uh, the scriptures. And, and this is, you guys, are, you guys are living this today. Whoever's telling history, there's a little bit of a... a I won't say bent. I'm not going to say that it's, it's lied. That's not at all what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is that when you come from a different perspective, you tell different details of history, okay? And that's Sennacherib's, and we're going to look at Isaiah's. Um, I want to show a map here, because I'll refer to this 
from time to time uh, in, as we go through this, just to get a perspective. Remember, Assyria is up here in the north, northeast, and they're going to swoop down. But they go down around Jerusalem, and they right now, when, when this story is happening, the, the king of, of Assyria, Sennacherib, is fighting down here in Lachish, in this lower corner of that circle. Lower, lower point of that circle, in, down in Lachish. And he sent, last week, we looked at Rabshakeh, up to Jerusalem to talk to Hezekiah. Now, I get the perspective that, that there are, there's a, they're surrounded Jerusalem. They're just not fighting. The fighting is happening down in Lachish. Okay? And so that's going to come up in the midst of chapter 37. Now, what I want you to do, we're going to go through history, and you're going to say, well, what's that got to do with me? And that's what I want to do, is think about what does this have to do with you as we go through this. Because we're on the other side of Christ. We're not Jews. We're not battling Assyria. We're on the other side of Jesus Christ. We know some of the salvation. We still have salvation in front of us, but we have received salvation. How does this fit into our lives, this story of Hezekiah and Sennacherib? Let's, let's pray before we go into this. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for... Uh, I personally thank you, Lord. It's been just exciting to go through this. And I pray, Father, this morning that you'll somehow encourage us, build us up, equip us to, do, uh, to walk with you and to handle things that come upon us. We give thanks to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, we're going to work through uh, Isaiah 37. So turn over to it. All right. And when King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself in sackcloth, entered the house of the Lord. Okay, so what we're talking about is what he heard last week from Rabshakeh. Remember, he was standing outside the wall and saying how, hey, we're going to destroy you. Don't think, any, don't think Egypt's going to help you. Don't think God's going to help you. We're going to destroy you. So that's what Hezekiah does. He tears his robes, a sign of, of, of desperation, really. And he goes into the temple. And then he calls, or he sends for, Isaiah. He, he, he sends a message to Isaiah. So here we are in verse, verse 3. Uh, they said to him, okay, this is to, to Hezekiah, thus, or excuse me, to Isaiah. Thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, rebuke, and rejection. For children have come to birth, and there is no strength to deliver. Perhaps the Lord your God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, offer a prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of Hezekiah came to Isaiah. Okay, So what's he asking for? He's asking Isaiah to pray. To pray on their behalf. You, you could say it's a simple request, but he is acknowledging something really important here to catch. He says, his master, meaning the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, has sent this message to Hezekiah to reproach the living God. Don't miss that. It's going to show up all the way through here. It's a theme throughout this passage. That the attack of Sennacherib is not so much on Hezekiah. It's not so much on the, the city, but it is on the God of Hezekiah. Keep that clear. Um, Let's go on to verse 6 and 7, because this, this is Isaiah's response back to Hezekiah. Isaiah said to them, You shall say to your master, this, to, to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servant of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so that he will bear, hear a rumor and return to his own land and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. All right, now that sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? So he's, going to do, he's got two things in here. That the king is going to hear a rumor, return to his own land, then he's going to die in his own land. Okay, it sounds like quick deliverance, doesn't it? All right, well, it's not quite so much. Now, look at verse 8 and 9, because some of it happens right here. Now, we don't know how long the time frame between the time of Isaiah saying that in these next two verses, but here's what it says. Then Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna. Now, do you remember the map? Okay. You see Libna right above, or just to the north of Lachish? Okay, so that supplies right here. Then Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he had heard that the king had left Lachish. Now listen to this, because okay? here's the rumor that Isaiah was talking about. When he, heard that they, when he heard them say concerning 
Tiraka, king of Cush, he has come out to fight against you. And when he heard it, he sent a message to Hezekiah. All right, this is the rumor. When he's down here talking to uh, Sennacherib, down here in Lachish or in, in Libna, where the battle's really raging, they hear a rumor about the king of Cush coming to fight. Who in the world is king of Cush? Somebody else is in this battle. Remember, south of, of Jerusalem, south of Judah, is Egypt. And if you go south and east of there is Cush. Okay? And it, if you read Hezekiah's writing, it's really Egypt and Ethiopia. And Cush is really considered that whole thing. You, you get into some of it, and it gets a little bit fuzzy because many of them were referring to the king of Cush as Pharaoh. That when you referred to one, you freed them all. So it's a little bit fuzzy on, on the, the timing and everything like that. But that's, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a nation down here, and he's hearing this rumor of this attack. And it's affecting this battle. All right? But out of that, what, what Rabshakeh does, he sends another note or a comment back to Hezekiah. And that's what you're going to see in verse, oh, what? Verse 10, 10 through 13. Thus you shall say to Hezekiah, okay, so this is Rabshakeh coming back there. Uh, King of Judah, do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, destroying them completely. So will you be spared? Did the gods of those nations which my fathers have destroyed deliver them, even Gozan and Haran and Rezpah and the sons of Eden who were in Telassar? Where are the king of Hamath and the king of Arpad and the king of the city of Sepharvaim and of Hena and Iva. Do you see what Rabshakeh is doing? He's, he's dissing God. He's like, your God's no different than all these other gods. Okay, this is a really big deal. But that's what happens is he, he brings this letter to Hezekiah. And now Hezekiah is going to respond. That's in verse 14 through 20. Then Hezekiah, and I, I, I would say when, when, I, when I titled this, I titled it the letter because that, this letter is central to this whole thing. Okay, so here's what happens. Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. I love this picture. I just love this picture. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord saying, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God. You alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And listen to all the words of Sennacherib, who sent them to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of, kings of Assyria have devastated all the countries and their lands, and they cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, so they have destroyed them. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from His hand, and, that, and I love this part, deliver us from His hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. Okay? And, and isn't that, when we talk about sin, and we're sending people to all the world. Well, isn't that really what we're trying to do? When we're trying to share the gospel with somebody, isn't this what we're trying to do? Isn't this what uh, is on God's heart from beginning to end, is that the world may know that He is God. Okay? But this is what uh, Hezekiah did. He took that, that letter, and he laid it out, and he prayed. Now, what's interesting here is the next response is from Isaiah. So Isaiah sends a note uh, from 37, verse 21. Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent word to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. Do you understand? I, I got a little gag right here. What has happened here is that Hezekiah prayed to God. God responded to Isaiah, and Isaiah came and talked to Hezekiah about what God told him. See, think about this. Hezekiah prayed. He laid this out before God. He prayed, and then he went home. Do you get that? He didn't get a direct answer. 
And isn't that what we experience? We'll go in and we're in, in some kind of need and we'll lay it out before the Lord. But oftentimes we'll walk away and not have a clear answer, not have an understanding of what God heard. Did he hear me? And what's he going to do? And this is a picture of how God is working, even though we don't necessarily see it. But in this case, God sends a message from Hezekiah back to, or from Isaiah back to Hezekiah. Okay. Gets a little confusing, verse 22 to 25. Because here, Hez, or excuse me, Isaiah is speaking to Hezekiah, but he's talking about Sennacherib, and specifically talking about what Sennacherib thinks of himself. Okay? So here's 22 through 25. She has despised you and mocked you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She has uh, shaken her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. He's basically saying that Jerusalem is, is kind of not thinking very highly of you, Sennacherib. Okay? Verse 23. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? And against whom have you raised your voice and haughtily lifted up your eyes? Against the Holy One of Israel. Through your servants you have reproached the Lord. And you have said, with my many chariots, I came up on the heights of the mountains to the remotest parts of Lebanon, and I, cal- and I cut down all its tall ce- cedars and its choice cypresses, and I will go to its highest peak and thickest forest. I dug wells and drank waters, uh, and with the sole of my feet I dried up the rivers of Egypt. You see, he's, he's, God is pointing out what Sennacherib has lifted, him up, lifted up himself, and he said all this stuff about himself, arrogance, Okay? But really what he's done is he's dissed the God of Israel. Okay? Now it changes a little bit right here in verse 26. And now God is talking to Hezekiah through Isaiah about Sennacherib, but he's kind of telling Sennacherib about himself, God. God is telling, talking to Sennacherib about himself. Look in 26. He says this. Have you not heard? Long ago I did it. From ancient times I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass that you should turn fortified cities into ruinous heaps. Remember, if you remember back in all that we've been teaching in Isaiah, all this, been, all this has been prophesied. The king of Assyria is God's tool. He's doing something through him. This is not catching God by surprise because he planned it. He brought the king of Assyria to do it. And that's what he's pointing out to Sennacherib. You think you're so great Don't you realize I'm the one who gave this to you and you're dissing me? He goes on in 27. Therefore the inhabitants were short of strength. They were dismayed and put to shame. They uh, were as the vegetation of the field and as the green herb and the grass of the housetops is scorched before it is grown up. But I know you're sitting down and you're going out and you're coming in and you're raging against me. Because of your raging against me, and this is a key passage, and because your arrogance has come before my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. Okay? This is is a key, key passages here. God's stepping in and doing something here. Let's go on in verse 30 through 35. This is God now, through Isaiah, instead of talking about uh, or to Sennacherib, now he's talking to Hezekiah. Okay? Verse 30 through 35. Then this shall be the sign for you. You will eat this year the, what grows of itself. In the second year what springs up from the same. And in the third year sow, reap, plant vineyards, eat their fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion survivors, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come to the city. These are key words, by the way, historically. These are very key words. He will not come to this city or shoot an arrow here. And he will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. By the way he came, By the same way he will return, and he will not come to this city, declares the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. These are key words because this is how it went out historically. uh, Assyria has been destroying everything, even in Judah. 
meaning all those other cities. He took them. But when he got to Jerusalem, he didn't even come. He didn't set up a siege work. He didn't attack. He didn't fire an arrow. All these words came true. Very unusual that Sennacherib wouldn't have destroyed this city. Very unusual. Okay? This is, historically, this is cool. And you're bringing all this history together and looking at this. Wow, God. But there's something important to catch here. Do, do you notice at the beginning he talks about in this first year, you, you'll eat whatever you find. Next year, you'll kind of eat the same. In the third year, you'll plant and you'll reap. What's he talking about? This is going to be a, a long time. This is not a quick fix. It's not like tomorrow things go back to normal. That this, you're going to suffer a little longer, three years, really, before this kind of gets back to some semblance of normal. Okay, so he's giving them a little heads up. And so there's a definite need for perseverance in all this. Remember, Hezekiah was righteous and, and all these bad things happened. God is still delivering him, even though it looks kind of rough. Okay, these, are, these are important things. I want you to look at now verse 36 through 38. Then the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, all of these were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. It came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adremelech and Shirzer, Shirzer, his sons, killed him with a sword. And they escaped into the land of Ararat, and Esarhaddon, his son, became king in his place. Okay? Happened, right? Looks like it's the next day, ten years later. Okay? From the time of the attack on Jerusalem to this killing of Sennacherib is ten years. Okay? So what looks like very quick, it was, took some time to happen. Now, the, does Sennacherib talk about 185,000 dying? No. Does Hezekiah talk about 200,000 people being taken into captivity? No. There's lots of, of, of research and, and suggestions. Many of the common suggestions are that it was a plague that attacked. It wasn't on a, an army battle that killed 185,000. It was more of a plague from rats or something else. Okay. But bottom line, something happened, and it's, it's obvious that something happened that made Snecrib go back and not continue his battle on to Jerusalem. He just left him. Now, uh, there's a lot here. I've got five takeaways from this. Five things for us to think on this side of the cross. Okay? Uh, first of all, God is involved in the affairs of men, in the affairs of nations. So when you look around you today and you look at this world being chaotic, don't think that God has lost control. You could see, Hezekiah could have looked at this and said, Wow, well, where's God? Well, God had this king in his hand. You see? And so we, we can rest in that. Now, it may still be tumultuous, if you will. It might be still trouble. We might be uh, having trouble finding food. I, I understand that. And there's reason to cry out to God. But knowing the fact that God is God above all this is really comforting. The second point is that we will probably suffer even while doing good. And that was, that was a key piece of this. He was, he was marching towards God and bringing the whole nation with him when this hard time came upon him. And, and in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12-13, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised when the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, Keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. Now, we see the, the difficulty Hezekiah is in, and probably you have all been in this position too. And if you haven't, you will be. Where you decide to set your face toward God and walk toward him, seeking Jesus and living in the grace he's given. And then hard times come. And you'll say... <laughs> maybe not out loud, but you'll say, God, what's up? <laughs> I'm walking with you. Isn't this supposed to bring goodness? Because that's the whole prosperity gospel, is it not? That if you walk with God, all good things will happen to you. That's where it falls down, is this realization is not in the people. 
We've got to be a people, and we've talked about this through cultivating an enduring faith, is we've got to be a people who go face toward God no matter what happens, and we trust Him. And we see examples like this. Remember, the Old Testament is written as an example to help us now. And that's why this story is so exciting to me, is because I can gain some things from this. I can gain endurance and encouragement from this fact of keep my face toward Him. Now, one of the things is, I, I realize this, when I look at this story of Hezekiah, I think of myself as Hezekiah. What would I do if I was that guy, right? Do you too? What if you were Shebna, <laughs> the scribe? He's just one of the guys listening to Rabshakeh, right? He's getting this message, and he's been told not to say anything to Rabshakeh. And then he just comes back to Hezekiah and tells him the story. He's just the messenger. Or maybe you're the guy on the wall with a spear, just waiting for him to start attacking you, and you're terrified. Or maybe you're a mom taking care of a baby inside the wall somewhere. Or an old person who doesn't have the strength to fight. You get what I'm saying is there are many people involved in this. We, we kind of focus on Hezekiah. But when, when, when things happen, and, and again, I'm thinking of our country right now. We've got a president. We think that's all where all the focus is right now. But there's a lot of people in the Senate and in the Congress and yeah, in the... In the, in the, uh, the Supreme Court, there's the word, right? But there's a lot of us too, right? And do we not all apply this? Shouldn't this apply to each of us? Of, of recognizing, do we have our face toward God? And are we looking to Him for strength? Do we recognize He's the one in control and trusting in that? In, in, um, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of the dark, this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Do you realize that what was going on there was not a battle between Hezekiah and Sennacherib? It was a heavenly battle. And, and that's the thing we've got to realize. If we get in and in, in understand that conflicts between people, you know, your friends, your people sitting next to you, or your spouse, or... or or whatever, it's, it's not, our battle's not there. If you're uh, upset about the government, this, that, and other thing, our, our battle is not there. If it's concerns about other nations, that's not where our thoughts should be. Our battle isn't against uh, the people. It is these spiritual forces. And that means we've got to fight this battle, just like Hezekiah, we've got to fight it in spiritual ways. Okay? And that's why Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, if you keep going from there, you get into, you put on the full armor of God. And I referred to this a couple weeks ago in cultivating an enduring faith. And I do think this, is, this has got it all in there. E even if you just look at, uh, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist. Isn't that what Hezekiah was doing? He was resisting in this time, Right? And there's going to be times where we've got to resist evil. It might be false teaching of some sort inside the church. It might be false philosophies outside the church. We're trying to figure out how to run a government, how to run a country. It could be teaching that comes in. It could be uh, just a temptation to do sin, just the, the appeal of the world. It could be a lot of different things that are attacking you, but how do you stand firm? You put on this full armor of God. And he talks about things like truth and righteousness, both the righteousness of Christ that he imposes on us, but also us walking in righteousness. All these things fit in here. Look at that. At the end of that armor of God is prayer. And, and that's a central part of this story of Hezekiah. And I tell you what, I, I do, I love that picture. Have you ever had something on your heart and burdening you so much that you laid it out before the Lord? Either as a letter or yourself? Or like Jesus, he went off into a desolate place to pray? Some prayer, most of our prayers are going to be as we walk along the way, or maybe before a meal or something like that. But sometimes, some things require something a little more dramatic. And I'm not talking about it for dramatic sake, but I'm talking about the sincerity, the, the severity of the, of the need of this call. I love this picture. There'll be times where you need to, to do that, to lay out your petition before God. I, I remember a time when I still live in Colorado, 
and we were trying to figure out what to do. And I, I remember physically going across the street into the schoolyard at night, laying in the grass and crying out, and literally tears, crying out to God just for direction. And just like Hezekiah, I got up from that prayer and I went home, I went to bed and went on with life. But I know he heard and I can look back at direction that was given through that and provision. Okay? I, I didn't have a, a prophet come and tell me what God thought and all that stuff, but I do know he heard me. And, and you may have examples like that too, or there may be something in your future that this, in, this, this story of Hezekiah can be an encouragement to you. The fifth thing out of this passage is to remember. Remember that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, right? Now, you've probably heard that passage out of 1 John chapter 4. But did you know Hezekiah said this? I didn't. Hezekiah, or excuse me, 2 Chronicles 32, 7. This is Hezekiah talking to his people. He says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed because of the king of Assyria, nor because of all the horde that is with him. For the one with us is greater than the one with him. It's slightly different, right? It says, it goes on, it says, With him is only an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us to fight our battles. And the people relied on the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do you see how the words of one person encouraged a whole group, a whole city? It's an important piece. But then John says that same thing in 1 John. I'll just read it. For, uh, for you are from God, little children, and, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you. Notice the difference? In Hezekiah, it was with us. Now it's in you. There's a big change on this side of the cross. Okay? This is a big, big change. I want to, to, I want to have you turn to Romans chapter 8. And I want to kind of finish with this passage. And, and uh, after I'm done, I'm going to have uh, Ben go back to a song. And I don't know if you want to sing it, but I want to look at the last verse of that song at the end of this. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Um, I guess I got to get to it. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, 31 through 39. It, it doesn't say it the same way, but it's the same thought. The greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In, in 831, it says it this way. It says, what, shall we, or what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Uh, do, do you get that thought? Do you understand what he's saying there? The significance of this? That, that just like Hezekiah had to be convinced or reminded that God, I mean, he was reminding other people and then he had to be reminded and he needed to, to, to be able to hold on to the fact that God was God. He's above everybody, everything. Even though it looks terrible right now, hold on. And that's what he says here in Romans. If God is for us, who is against us? Now, God is, on, is for those who are in, on this side of cross, I'll say it that way. Though he is for those who are in Christ. And I got this picture from the end of this passage, and we'll get there. Think about the, the people in Jerusalem were delivered. The people outside Jerusalem were not. Okay? And what am I talking about? On this side of cross, I'm saying, are you in Christ? Have you believed that God has sent His Son and delivered you by faith, by His grace? Do you get that? That that's where our confidence has to lie. And that's what it means, like being inside the walls of Jerusalem. Here's the rest of 831 <clears throat> and following. It says in 31, If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. You, you can hear the court case going on. right? This is a little bit different. It's not like a military battle. This is like a court case being accused. You're accused of being evil. You're going to go to hell but we have 
Jesus there interceding for us. Our defense attorney, he's, he's all powerful. Look, go on 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, listen to this, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. See, both of these kings in the story of Hezekiah and Sennacherib think they won. They both write it and look at it as though they, they won. God is the one who conquered. Sennacherib got to his end and, and went away. Hezekiah will rise. Here we go in verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and I don't know if that picture helps you of being inside the walls of Jerusalem. That thought of being in Christ Jesus is what I'm talking about. Of, of by faith and in our total confidence that God is above everything. We can handle and, and we can submit to His way, walking in the Spirit to deal with relationship problems. And we can deal with them His way. We can, we can enter into politics and the, and the things of our government and we can enter, them into, enter into it God's way. And if we don't know what it is, look for it. Start seeking God's way to how to deal with political things or differences of opinion or, or how to deal with you think you're getting old and, and your body breaking down, everything, having kids, how to parent, all this stuff is what's God's way. And we can see how God is God over everything. And, and, and we can endure no matter what comes because we're holding on to Him and we're setting our face toward Him like Hezekiah and lay it out before the Lord. Uh, ben, you got that into that song? This really touched me. If it was there. No, there you go. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. You think about it, in the inside of Jerusalem, it was a tough time. They were thinking they were going to lose. They were thinking they were going to starve or run out of water. And it was a long time. There's a, there's a need for an enduring faith. There's a need for us to look at history like this in, in an Old Testament passage and be encouraged today. So join me in prayer. Father, thank you for your deliverance. Thank you, Lord. We don't know what's in our future, but I pray that this encouragement this morning will help us to hang on to you, help us to not lose faith, not get caught up in things of the world or fall away in any way, but to seek you and hold you on to you and trust in your deliverance because there is no God but you. To you be glory in us through Jesus Christ.